The very first time I remember seeing a cup like this, I was sat on the front row of the classroom on my very first day of school. And as you'll know about anyone who sits on the front row, they are the eager beavers. They're the ones who want to be seen as good girls and good boys. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and I remember sitting there on that front row of, of the classroom, looking up at, at the person that I then realised she was called teacher. She was sipping on her cup of tea, waiting for us all to settle down. And I realised that person with this cup of tea was the person that I was supposed to impress. She was the one that I wanted to have praise me. And I spent the whole of my school career seeking praise, wanting to be seen as the good girl. The very best day would be when I'd get my workbook back from doing a piece of homework or a piece of work. And at the bottom of the page would be a sticker with a smiley face and it would say, excellent work. Yeah, that felt really good. And the very worst day would be when I opened up that workbook and at the bottom of the page were two words in red handwriting. See me. <laughs> oh my God, see me meant that I had done something wrong, meant that I was kind of in trouble. And, and good girls didn't, didn't get in trouble. They definitely didn't want to get in trouble. So one day, I was asked to do a little bit of homework. And I was told, write about a dream that you have once had. And I was really serious about my homework. So I went back home. This is me at school. I went back home and um, sat at the kitchen table and very you know, thought about it for a long time. And I, what, what do I dream about? And, and I wrote very carefully and very consideredly with my, my thick pencil. I was only allowed to write in pencil at that time. I wrote, I never dream full stop, but one day my brother dreamt about oranges, full stop. And I even drew a picture of oranges, my brother's dream oranges, just to emphasise the point. And I was, I was quite proud of my homework. I thought, yeah, maybe one of those stickers with a good girl was in order. And so when I got the homework back, I opened it up and I was you know, feeling really good about it, really excited. And I looked to the bottom of the page, see me. Oh my God. My heart jumped up into my throat instantly and I could feel the colour rushing from my whole body to my ears. They were bright red. And I found myself slipping out from behind my chair and walking like a zombie towards my teacher, pointing. Why had she written see me? Now she took me and she said, Sarah, let's have a look at this piece of homework. And she sat down and she got out her red pen. Sarah, you see there's a problem here. Everybody dreams. You probably just don't remember your dreams, she said. And inside, I was fuming. I didn't care about the science and what everyone else did or didn't do when they were sleeping, but I was certain I had never remembered one of my dreams, so I probably didn't have dreams. My six-year-old self was certain of that. But what I couldn't do was stop her crossing out my words and putting her own. I was fuming inside, but I could not stop that because I was already the good girl. And good girls do not answer back to the teacher. Good girls don't cause trouble. And good girls definitely do not rock the boat. Good girl, number, good girl rule number one then is don't rock the boat. And so this cup became a symbol for me of what it is to be a good girl or a good boy. We're not just talking about ladies here. <laughs> Inside the cup are all of the things that you're allowed to say, all of the things that are polite, that are socially acceptable, that are politically correct. And the cup itself is the container that we use to <coughs> keep our communication in a socially acceptable form. It's rules like better keep your mouth shut and be thought a fool than to open it and prove everybody right. It's things like, if you can't think of anything nice to say, then don't say anything at all. And this cup holds in place our communication. And outside, there's a whole world of possibility of communication. But we tell ourselves, don't say that, you might offend somebody. Don't say that, you might cause trouble. Don't say that, 
That's politically incorrect. So that was the cup for me. And it wasn't so much a problem that I was a good girl age six. In fact, probably it was a quite a pleasure for my teacher. The problem was that it stuck. Some years later, I was living in Paris, and I had just moved there, in fact. Here's me in Paris. I was there to live the life bohemian. I, I thought of myself a bit of an artist. And I had a lovely friend called Beth. Beth was a short Californian who'd been living there for a number of years, and she knew her stuff. She spoke fluent French, and she knew all about the culture. In fact, she was also a social anthropologist, so she knew it from a number of different angles. And she took her arm around me. Actually, it was more like this because she really was quite short. So she put her, her arm around me and said, Sarah, there's a few things you need to know about Paris. The way that these cafes are set up, all of the chairs in the street point forwards. Everybody in those Parisian cafes are sitting watching the street. So whenever you're walking along the street, you better make sure that you're well behaved, that you're dressed in a chic fashion, and that you definitely do not raise your voice. That is how a proper Parisian behaves. And I thought, oh, brilliant, that's okay, because I'm a good girl. I, I know how to behave on the street. I can do that. Yeah. So there we were, one evening, tottering down the street in our little heels, looking all chic and Parisian. And we, we sat down to have a little girly chat on a bench. And instantly, quick as you like, a, a guy came and started hovering over us. And he said, eh, est-ce que toi de feu? Which means, hello, have you got a light? Actually, he said, et princesse, which means princess, hello. And um, immediately, Beth stood up and walked away. I was shocked. Uh, she's normally such a, a nice, polite, pleasant person. And now she was just walking away from this guy in the street. You know, he's probably a perfectly nice person. I stood up and chased behind her, galloping a little bit, saying, Beth, wh what's going on? Behind us, this guy was shouting, hey, let's get to the fur! And... Um, Beth kept walking. In fact, now she was walking faster. And then it happened. He started shouting at us on the street. He sh started shouting things that, to my limited understanding of French, were not very complimentary. They weren't very pleasant, and they weren't very pretty, let's say that. And before, you, before I knew what was happening, people in the cafe nearby were starting to raise eyebrows, starting to tut a little bit, starting to look at us. I could feel the colour coming into my cheeks. Beth swung around and squared up to this gentleman. And he must have been almost twice her height. He, she squared up to him and she started speaking back to him in this flow of a very expressive French language. I didn't understand it all, but I heard something about disgusting behaviour, something about how would you feel if you were talking to your sister like this, something about show some respect. And my behaviour, instead of standing up for us and for other women who might be in that similar situation, my reaction was to step back and blush and wish that Beth wasn't speaking in that way. Because I was embarrassed. I was wanting to be a good girl. And she was the one making a show of herself. What I didn't know was that she had experienced that same scenario countless times in her time in Paris. Countless times. And she had tried to be nice, she tried to be pleasant, and she'd had enough. None of that had worked. So she had turned herself into this fierce, bold beast. Not a good girl, a bold beast. One who knew that any time she was going to be challenged on something that was so important to her, she would say no. I, on the other hand, was just a good girl. I had an opportunity to change that sometime later when I was back in London, and I walked past a building site. Oh, good girl rule number two, yes. Good girl rule number two is to be nice. Don't make any enemies wherever possible. So onto this building site. I walked past a building site, and as, as I had just passed, just as they were very at the, at the tip of my peripheral vision, a guy started saying to me something like, Ooh, like the way you move, like the way you smell. Mm, 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 mm. And, well, okay, my first reaction was shock. <laughs> Did he really say that? Um, it, aren't there laws against that in Britain? And then my next reaction was, was questioning. 
you know, w was he really speaking to me? Surely I, I was wrong. And then my next reaction was judgment. Maybe, maybe I made the mistake. Or maybe I'm wearing too short a skirt today. Maybe it's my fault. And I walked on. And when I got home, I realized what had happened. I'd, I'd had a chance to think, and I'd realized that this guy had crossed my line. This guy had stepped beyond what I thought was acceptable. And I'd done nothing about it. So I, I rolled up my sleeves, and I thought, right, next time I walk past this building site, I'm going to damn well say something. And the very next day, I walked past that gate, and I thought, oh, this is brilliant. No one said anything. Oh, phew. Thank goodness. And suddenly, there was a comment again, this time about my shoes. And I stopped for a second. And now my blood was boiling. And then, again, there was that doubt. Did he really say that? If he did, is it worth causing a scene? Isn't there something more important you should be doing right now? And I walked on again. No bold beast like Beth, just the good girl. Good girl rule number three. You're probably wrong anyway. Don't make a fool of yourself. So this is how I have lived most of my life, as a good girl. And I was given the opportunity a little bit later on to show myself in my full colours. And the way that I managed to do this was by thinking of the different leadership examples that we have in the world. Think of what a world would be like if we were only good girls or good boys. Think of what the world would be like if Gandhi were an angel as opposed to a pain in the backside for the British Empire. If he said, oh, sorry, you don't want an independent India, don't worry then, I'll just go back to my spinning. If Churchill, instead of standing up to Hitler, had decided to be a good boy and share his toys with him. If Emmeline Pankhurst, who strove hard for the women's vote with her suffragette movement, if she instead had gone home and made a nice cup of tea. Or if the unknown student in Tiananmen Square had seen those tanks rolling through the street and instead of standing in the way, had said, who am I? I'm just one person. What does my voice matter? Sometimes there is a tank rolling through your street, whether that is a company boss asking you to work extra time when you should be spending it with your family, whether that is somebody looking for you to compromise on your values because they want to do something different to you, whether that is a builder in the street who is harassing you or a woman that you know. Sometimes there is a line that you need to draw in the pavement and to stand firmly by it and say, this is what I believe in and nobody else is going to move me from here. And that's what I encourage you to look for as leaders. Find the thing that you care enough about to look foolish for. Find the thing you care enough about to have everybody in the room think that you're an idiot for. And find the thing that, like this guy in Tiananmen Square, the thing that you would be willing to risk your life for. So, this meeting, sometime later, I felt a little bit like this. Oh, right, I, I've failed many, many times. I've still been this good girl. I really want to break through. I really want to find the bold beast inside me. And there was a gentleman who I was meeting with who I wanted to, to partner with in my business. It was going to be quite a lucrative deal if it went through. And I, I thought that, that the meeting was going quite well until he started making some strange comments. He started saying, oh, your shoes, a bit taller than they were last time we met. You're, you're a bit taller than me now. That's a bit strange. Probably you shouldn't be wearing them in the future. And instantly... I thought, excuse me, how dare you make a comment about, about my shoes? This is not a comment that you would make to a fellow professional who is male. Now, this is not about being male or female. This is about him finding my line and crossing it. And so inside, this bold beast became active. It was a feeling here that wanted to rise up and say something. But at the same time, there was the good girl. She was saying, please, 
don't say anything, not here, not now. He probably didn't mean it. Just, just go along with it. But the bold beast was already saying, no, you must stand up for what you believe in. You really must. Just, just send him an email, the good girl said. Please, just, you know, don't return his calls. Whatever you do, don't make a fool of yourself. Not here, not in public. But the good girl was defeated and the bold beast was winning. And I didn't know whether any words were going to come out of my mouth. I didn't know whether I was going to look really stupid or really intelligent. And I didn't know whether I was going to be able to say what I was, able to, what, what I was wanting to say without tears. But I found myself saying, I'm sorry, a few things that you've said in this meeting were not in line with my values. And I'm afraid I don't want to work with you. And what happened to this cup was this. Yeah. I broke my cup and it felt amazing to be able to communicate outside my comfort zone. And what I realised when I looked at the cup that had been holding my communication all that time was that it wasn't as important as I thought. It wasn't made from precious china. Like this, it was made from sugar glass. Don't worry about your feet. <laughs> So my message to you all today is find that part of you that would stand in front of a tank if it had to. Find the communication that is powerful. It may be messy, it may be wild, it may be politically incorrect, but it will be real, it will be true. Rock the boat. Don't seek enemies, but don't expect everybody to be your friends. I, um, uh, also, you know, don't expect everybody to be your friends. And trust your intuition, trust yourself. Find the bold beast within you and say goodbye to that good boy or the good girl. Thank you.